my biggest lesson learned out of all of that was to keep your monthly uh, expenses as low as possible while driving your income as high as possible. Would it be pre premature to call you Maine's king of cannabis? <laughs> so, that, I got a lot of fact <laughs> for that. I'd like to welcome our listeners to the Bolus Beat podcast. I'm your host, Greg Bolus. The Bolus Company is Northern New England's largest commercial real estate services firm with offices in Portland, Maine, as well as Manchester and Portsmouth, New Hampshire. We've been selling and leasing real estate in Maine and New Hampshire since 1975. This podcast is designed to provide insight into Maine's business movers and shakers. And speaking of business leaders, I'd like to welcome Cliff Miller to the Bolus Beat. Cliff Miller is a founder of Canapa Valley Farms, based in Michigan, where he leads the development and execution of the company's long-term strategy. Recently, Cliff took cannabis development to another level in Michigan. As a founder, Cliff spent three years developing the most technologically advanced cannabis campuses in the country, with a redefined focus on automation and the newest technology available. Cliff has set the tone for what large-scale cannabis will look like in the future. If this isn't enough, Cliff also owns and operates the largest wholesale cannabis company in the state of Maine. Cliff received both an MBA and an MS in teaching from Purdue Global. His academic accomplishments have equipped him with the know-how to be successful in many different capacities. Cliff is 38 years old. In addition to his love of business, Cliff enjoys hiking and traveling with his wife, Jenny, daughter, Scarlett, and his dogs. Welcome to the Bolus Beat, Cliff. Thanks, Cliff. Appreciate your, your sitting down for the interview. Um, before we get into the marijuana growing business and of all the success you've had, I think our viewers would be interested in knowing that your road to the present wasn't always smooth. You grew up in Lisbon, but were kicked out of two different high schools three times. Is that correct? That's correct. And now that's a dubious distinction. Um, what were you doing for the teachers to love you so much? Uh, so in Lisbon, uh, very disrespectful, to be quite honest. I, uh, the teachers? The teachers, absolutely. <laughs> it was mostly their fault. Um, no, I just, the authority, uh, the authority piece for me, even at an early age, was very difficult. I felt I knew better and I knew what I wanted to do. So when confronted about what I should be doing or a different path, I wasn't always the most receptive uh, to their thoughts and ideas. Um, fighting was a big one. I found myself in an awful lot of fights with other people and classmates. No fighting with teachers physically, but yeah. it was uh, a lot of combative nature every day. So I read in an article somewhere you described yourself as a really bad crib kid, really bad kid growing up. Mm. Uh, because of that or other things? Um, most, a lot of it, when you look back on it, was fairly disrespectful. Um, never been arrested. Thank the Lord for that. Well, there's still time. <laughs> <laughs> there is. I'm running out of it, though, so I got I to gotta get on the ball. Uh, maybe have a little more fun. Yeah. Uh, but no, it was just uh, the disrespectful nature. I, I, I didn't feel I belonged in school. I didn't f fit in anywhere. Um, in middle school, I was a good athlete, so that was a that was a part that I really enjoyed doing. Uh, was the athletics, the camaraderie with my friends. And uh, as I got a little bit older, uh, I just wanted to be out in the real world making money. I felt I was a lot older than I really was, and I got uh, expelled twice from Lisbon and then tried it again at 16 in Brunswick, and that lasted about two months before I was asked to leave there. So while you didn't graduate from high school in the traditional manner, you did get a GED. Correct. Then you went on to college and received two master's degrees. Correct. I have two undergraduate degrees and two master's degrees, yes, sir. Um, that turnaround, that's a huge turnaround. Yep. What, why? What happened? Uh, as I started approaching um, what we'd call early adult life. I was about 17 years old and uh, thank God for my mother. She she said, if you're not going to be in school, you're going to be doing something. And she enrolled me at the Lewiston uh, Vocational School. I think it was uh, Lewiston Tech or something like that, where uh, I took a real estate course at 17 years old, um, put on by uh, Mr. Warden of ERA Warden, if you remember that name yeah. from way back when. And uh, the course was a lot of fun. And I was working at the Muddy Rudder at the time, full time. And I would see a lot of these guys come into the, the bar and sit down. And it was the middle of the day. So, of course, they were always asking, what's a 15, 16, 17-year-old kid doing here and not in school? So they learned my story. And I learned that real estate and kind of stocks and just a lot about business was the way to go. So jumped into 
real estate education early on. And two weeks after I turned 18, I was issued my real estate license. Um, and then from there, I kind of understood that this can only get you so far. Uh, I need some some deeper education, kind of those degrees that mm-hmm. that wall that that wall status of your your frame degrees to kind of get you to the next level. And the two masters you got were degrees were in what? Uh, I got a master's in business administration, and then I got a master's of science in teaching. Oh, impressive! Um, in your late teens, you started to accumulate real estate. At mm-hmm. the age of 21, I believe you owned 125 apartment units? Uh, I had 125 units. It was probably scattered across 20, 25 buildings, yes. Uh, and at the time, at 21 years of age, I'm sure you felt you were on top of the world until a family friend, Peter Anastas, who we both know quite well, asked you for uh, asked you a fundamental question. Uh, do you recall what that question was? Yes. Uh, how much do you have in your savings? Yeah. So you thought you were on top of the world, he says, yeah, but how much you got in the bank? Literally put and me in you, check. And your answer was? Like $1,500. Yep. So when the 2008 housing bust occurred, what happened to your holdings, 125 units? That I started liquidating a little before. In t- 2006, um, After I, I spent uh, a small time as a realtor from about 18 to 20. And then at 20 years old, I started, I got into the lending world uh, with a group here in Scarborough and uh, really learned the in and out of how to get your money to buy property. Uh, and I started to see the winding down of the quick approval process. Things were getting difficult to close. So I started unloading a lot of my properties in the 2006 7, uh, 2006, 7 area. Uh, but as it got to the 2008, uh, when things weren't moving, no showings were happening, the adjustables were kicking in, um, I noticed there was a real, real heartache coming. And uh, fortunately, there were no foreclosures, no bankruptcies. I did two short sales out of all the properties I had and felt like I escaped it pretty well. Um, I did have a trailer park in Hiram. Um, I think I actually called you on that at one point. And uh, I had to borrow $80,000 from my dad to get through all of the short sales and all of that just to cover my costs. And when I sold the trailer park, I made $81,000 to pay my dad back and then $1,000 to go back into my bank. So at least you were on the positive side, I guess. I, I, if, if compared to some, I felt I did okay. And it was a great learning experience the whole way through. Right. So the sudden success and failure of real estate, your real estate empire in the late 2000s must have indirectly shaped your current business strategies. Absolutely. And uh, how? Uh, very debt adverse. Um, I don't like having debt or mortgages on a lot of my properties. Um, I, my wife and I continue to this day to keep our monthly finances uh, in check to where if we both needed to go back to the muddy rudder and get serving jobs, we could survive. Uh, we don't do a lot of big houses and big cars and those types of expenses. So my biggest lesson learned out of all of that was to keep your monthly uh, expenses as low as possible while driving your income as high as possible and create an actual savings account. Yeah, that's, that's really great advice for anybody uh, starting out in life. True. Um, so how did you initially get into the marijuana business? That was by a fluke, honestly. Um, my, my, sister, uh, my sister was engaged to uh, uh, my partner and now brother-in-law, and uh, I knew he was kind of dabbling in it. It was at the very beginning and kind of onset of uh, legalized cannabis. And uh, believe it or not, I was in um, Washington, D.C., uh, meeting with um, a couple of the big banks and groups there. I don't want to any names out there and we were at the uh, Hilton downtown DC and all I could smell was cannabis pot everywhere and I was there with my legal team and finance team and I was like something's going on and it was the high times first annual business conference that was going on around (laughs) us while we were there and I saw that there was just this massive movement of true legalized cannabis coming to the country Um, And being a little bit too young to jump on any of the dot-com and kind of tech side of things, I said, this could be a great avenue to catch a new emerging market. So you started out initially in medical marijuana? Yeah, we all kind of had to. Yep. Um, And what you say you had to, why is that? Because it wasn't legal to sell non-medical marijuana? Uh, So most of the cannabis industry started off medically um, for caregivers to provide patients uh, that needed cannabis for medical purpose. Um, we had some dispensary licenses where um, some of the bigger groups in the state were able to grow 
plentiful amounts of cannabis for the small stores that were out there, uh, but there was a lack of direct caregiver to patient um, kind of line of line of purchase. So uh, we kind of jumped on that, knowing there were a lot of uh, patients that needed cannabis. Uh, and then as it kind of grew and transformed into something substantial, uh, they, the adult use or recreational version of cannabis came into play. And uh, I think we passed that in 2016. Uh, I don't think it went active until a couple of years later. Um, but you have your medical world and then your adult use or recreational world um, that are both kind of thriving in Maine right now. What did that do? And maybe you don't know the answer, maybe you do, but to the uh, sale of cannabis that wasn't legal. You know, I mean, for years, you know, it's, we, we grew up, you know, it was always illegal. Sure. Did that drive them out of business or is there still a market? There, there's still a market for that. Um, and, and sometimes they can call it the black market, the illicit market, whatever you want to call it. Um, honestly, some of the best cannabis is grown by the guys that don't have a medical card. They don't want to spend the money to be recreational or adult use. Uh, and they're just really great growers of cannabis. Uh, and they provide it like we would have got it growing up to your friends and family and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, but as we progress generationally, some of the younger users in their early 20s, they won't know any different than going to your medical store or your adult right. use store because the guy doesn't really exist or they're kind of aging out. Well, you don't really need them anymore. No, you don't. I, I do think there's a great quality that some of those guys provide. Um, historically, they've been growing 20, 30 years, so you've got that experience of some of those guys. Um, and they do have a place in the market for their knowledge and their experience. But as, as we progress into this, there is no real need when you can pop into any one of the 30 stores in Portland or anything off of 295 or 95 and grab good quality tested product right off the shelf. So educate me in terms of how long it takes to grow a marijuana plant from seed to when you can harvest it. Sure. Uh, so from, if you're starting from a, a seed, uh, it does take a little bit uh, of time and you wouldn't pick a single seed. You would probably pick a hundred seeds of a single strain to start with and you'd plant them all. And then you would find your best plants that kind of came out of that. They call it pheno hunting. Uh, and you would basically try to find the strongest, best plants, kind of the, the Spartan mentality where we're taking only the best of the best and those are gonna be our uh, kind of mother plants. Uh, once you would kind of create a mother plant, you could take a clone off it and then it goes into like a little rock wool or a gel or however you do your clones. And then from there, from that kind of clone stage, um, you probably got four to six weeks of what they would call vegetative growth where you're kind of getting the plant to size. And then you've got nine to 11 weeks, depending on the strain or genetic, to grow it to its full kind of smokable potential. And then you would harvest it, dry it, test it. So you've got, when you've got from seed to actual sale at a wholesale level, uh, at least three, three months, sometimes four. Okay. That's, so three times a year, you can have a harvest? For a single room. That's why if you had multiple rooms like we had, we have several bays on our facility where our vegetative bay is constantly producing for whatever is going to be next. So we, we like to shoot for five harvests, a flowering room every single year. So you started off in Lewiston putting up greenhouses and created Maine's first and only cannabis business park. Yep, uh, Auburn, right off of Minot. Auburn. Yep, right off of uh, Minot Ave. Uh, we actually had uh, some some great guys that we uh, we were working with. Um, we've done uh, there's probably 40, 50,000 square feet of cannabis facility in that park now. Uh, there's an extraction facility. There's retail. Uh, beautiful beautiful place to do it. Uh, Auburn couldn't have been more helpful. They, they were some of the first people or first uh, the first municipality to kind of put their hand up in the air and say, hey, we're willing to do this. We're willing to have uh, our town rehab some of these old buildings, bring some life back. And the fees and some of the cost that goes into running a facility is really helping the Auburn uh, municipality in terms of income and, and cash flow in. I mean, you're a big taxpayer, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> Um, I read somewhere that you built these buildings without any debt. Yeah, so it was really just a group of friends. Um, I have some good buddies uh, that we're still, uh, we still do projects together with. And we were doing uh, fix and flips on apartments. And we said, hey, we've got all of this, this cash to put into play. What if we sidelined the apartment 
fix and flip and maybe we went into cannabis. So we literally just transitioned from a couple of apartments into a big build. And as of right now, we have no debt. Equity has been paid back to everybody and it's a free and clear space for us. You eventually switched over from growing medical uh, marijuana to recreational marijuana yep. uh, when that was allowed by the state. Um, again, why recreational versus medical at this point? Is recreational more profitable? No, it's actually less. I think uh, the, the price for medical um, cannabis is a lot cheaper right now, um, where adult use or recreational is a bit more expensive. Um, in the adult use market, we have to we have to track and trace everything from the very beginning. So as soon as it's a seed or a clone, it gets a little tag. And then when it gets sold, uh, even at the dispensary level, there's a little tag that goes along with it that says, here's where it grew, this was batched as part of, it was tested, it's clean, it's, it's good product to sell. Um, and we just knew that if we wanted to get into a space for a merger and acquisition or to be purchased, that uh, the adult use way was probably um, probably the best way. Bigger market. Much bigger market um, and, and big money uh, outside of uh, outside of just some of the, the smaller projects that are, are being done. Uh, most of those people that would come in and either acquire or partner or merge, uh, they would want to be on the adult use on the adult use side. And if you took the medical marijuana. Uh, product and the recreational marijuana product side by side. Is there a difference? Um, some would argue yes or no. It, it really comes down to uh, the grower. I'm not a grower. Um, we've got my brother-in-law, Garrett, is just one of the, the best I've ever seen. Uh, but he has a passion for it. Uh, he has a passion for horticulture and, and learning how to steer the plants the right way and get the best product. Uh, and he does it so, so well. So just a huge admirer of what he can do. But I've seen him grow equally great medical cannabis as well as equally great adult use. Um, there are some kind of, incident, like if you were going to grow the old school way where you're going to put a bunch of plants outside and just let the sun hit it and shoot for shoot for the best and hopefully it all works out. I don't know that outdoor cannabis is going to be a competitor with an indoor type of uh, product, but uh, I think depending on who's growing it, medical and adult use can kind of have um, the best of both worlds in them. Then you focus on the cultivation side of the business and don't have any retail stores. No, we didn't. We've helped start, so we've done three different extraction facilities that we've helped upstart, um, and now the fourth in, in Michigan, which is up and operational. Um, retail was, was not something we were set up to do or prepared to do. Um, we may we may think about it down the road, um, but when you think about retail, you've got ten to fifteen different personalities every day. Um, it's in terms of employees, in terms of employees, and, and, and I'm glad we didn't because going into the the, the COVID kind of recession thing that we just went through, um, the call outs and the sickness and just the fear that a lot of people had kind of dampered that that. Mm -hmm in-person uh, kind of interaction. We did see um, delivery thrive in some of the markets. We did see curbside kind of kind of pop up and really start happening, which is nice. It gave a couple different avenues than just, uh, hey, come into our store and buy this. You could go online or go to an app and say, hey, I love this. Let's just put together an order, like your groceries or anything else. And, and that was a big piece for the market to have. So out of COVID came some some kind of benefits from that. And speaking of retail stores, it seems to be an awful lot of retail stores. And, and just observation, I don't see a lot of people going into them. Maybe if I yeah. came back in the old port at 11 o'clock at night, it would be different, but right. <laughs> at least during the day. And is, uh, is there an over-storing over of retail stores? Uh, maybe geographically you could pinpoint some, some areas of the state that had a couple too many. Uh, but that's a great thing about kind of capitalism is the, the fittest will survive and um, if you've got a good product and you've got a good kind of brand, you will, people will gravitate to that. Social media is a big thing to kind of get people into the stores and right. kind of create that brand awareness. Uh, so if you're really, if you're decent with social and you have good product and you've got a good name behind you, because Maine is a small community, people know who own these stores, they know who's growing. Um, and if you've got a good kind of uh, marriage of retail and flower or, or cannabis, um, the longtime consumer will know where, where to go. And do you think there'll be a shakeout on the retail side? I think we're seeing it now, yeah. So yep. seeing some stores close? And yeah, seeing some stores close, some that are just kind of kind of eking by, um, and then some that have just kind of 
closed up shop. I've seen a couple of stores that have even not not in the greater Portland area, kind of on the, the outer edges, but I've seen them go from retail to like local kind of convenience mom and pop grocery stores, um, just because it's good real estate, but with the amount of uh, competition and kind of oversight, sometimes it just becomes a little burdensome and they just kind of transition into something new. You know, uh, utility costs over the last year have gone through the roof. Yes. Yeah. And I remember when I, I met you uh, in Atlanta boarding a plane, yeah. uh, um, which is how this whole thing started. Uh, I remember you telling me that because of the way you construct your buildings and the lighting that you use, your operating costs are much lower than your competition. Correct. And at the time, you know, utility costs hadn't gone through the roof. But now that they have, can you explain the advantage that that gives you? Sure. So the type of facility we built, um, we, we were pretty public about the type of facilities we were building. Uh, very much an indoor kind of cultivation facility, uh, but we have a polycarbonate roof, so it's kind of like a greenhouse style roof. So we actually were able to use a lot of the natural sunlight, which cannabis thrives on, uh, as well as some of the, the benefits of um, kind of an indoor facility with heat and ACs and all of those things to kind of control the environment. Um, so, so we built these at a, we built these for a purpose to produce high quality cannabis at a, at a decent cost, but like the CMP thing where they did, uh, almost the 60% rate hike or double, which it feels like, um, we did see that, uh, but not as dramatic as everyone else did. So. Because your lighting is special, specialized lighting too, right? Correct. We also have our entire facilities with LED lighting as well. So, um, based on what the plants are getting. And again, this is getting a little technical, but we have sensors in our facility that say, this is how many, this is how much light your plants are getting. And if the sun isn't putting off that much, we have lights that kind of, uh, they'll go from 10% to 50% if there's a cloud. If there's no clouds in the sky and it's all sunlight, then the lights will go off. If it's a cloudy, dark day, lights will be on 90 to 100%. So we have some really good technology that helps drive uh, the interior and the environmentals of our facility. It's a really sophisticated operation. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and I assume at the end of the day, because of the way you designed and built these facilities, that you can deliver your product at a less less cost than yep. much of your competition? Absolutely, and we do. We, we were one of the first to uh, to bring it to a, a reasonable uh, a reasonable level. And, and we noticed as soon as we exited the, the, the medical market, there was a, a, a fairly dramatic price difference where medical cannabis was X and adult use cannabis was Y. And that was kind of some, that was kind of hindering the, the growth of adult use market. So we said, let's just be fair to the entire consumer base, medical or adult use. Let's just give the adult use guys medical style pricing. So the retail groups can thrive. Consumers can enjoy a, a similar price point between medical and adult use. And we were one of the first people to do that. And while we've seen a lot of people kind of trickle down their price point over the last year to 18 months, we've been steady at our price point for that exact time. We kind of set the bar where it should be. You know, we talked about the consolidation and the retail end of things. Yep. Does that, is that happening in the cultivation end of things? Yes, absolutely. And, and it, a lot of it goes back to some of those costs. Um, some people, when if you were running a little bit tighter margin on your facility and CMP hit you with a $25,000 a month bill instead of 15, that, that can really hit a bottom line pretty hard. Yeah. Uh, then we started to see some of the, the labor stuff shake out where, again, COVID was great for cannabis, but people were, were nervous to go to work. They didn't want to be around other people. And we, we were fortunate that we, we've had a, we have a great group of people that have been with us a long time. Uh, but some of the people started noticing we've got two guys out for two weeks. Now we got another two guys out for two weeks. So when you're losing a labor force with increased pricing, uh, you see a lot of stuff kind of just shake out. And again, a lot of these buildings were in existence already. Um, they're just adapted to. Yeah. So now they've either adapted to the pricing model um, or they've kind of gone back to just being good pieces of real estate, either warehousing or old industrial buildings that now have a new purpose that could be reused again five, 10 years later for non-cannabis. Now, you've been spending a lot of time in Michigan. Why don't you Correct. tell us what's going on out there? Uh, Michigan is, uh, is a wonderful site. Uh, Kanapa Valley Farms uh, is a 90-acre site um, in Vassar, Michigan. Uh, I've got some wonderful partners out there. Um, couldn't have asked for a better group of guys. Um, we built out the most technologically advanced facility in the country. And, and I say that in all seriousness because we've had 
a unique amount of validation from other experts all across the globe that have come in to either consult or to see what we're doing to prepare for purchases and stuff like that. And there's nobody that have, that's been in this industry for 10, 15, 20 years that's seen anything like we've built. And it's just, uh, it, it's something really, really impressive. And I've got literally some of my great guys, some of my family members out there working, and we've got some of the best guys we've ever met in cannabis out there working on it right now. And everybody's very, very excited at it. And the name, uh, Canap Canapa? Canapa, yep, Canapa Valley Farm. Is Italian for? <clears throat> uh, cannabis. Which is something I just learned about yeah. 15 minutes ago. So, it, and, it, and it's a fun, it's a fun take on it versus, because everything's so canna, 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 and uh, it's just fun to kind of pay homage. My, my partner is uh, Italian, and it's a fun way to pay homage to a, a new project for him, and I, it just it fits perfectly for, for what we're doing. It's a big 90-acre campus, so we've got almost this Napa Valley kind of cannabis thing going on. It's, just, it's a lot of fun. 90 acres, that's huge. That is huge, yeah. Um, this is just phase one. We've got There's more to come. I, 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 knowing <laughs> you, I suspect there is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, aren't most banks unwilling to u issue marijuana-related loans? And how do you get around that? Yeah, so that's where the private equity market has really thrived. Um, we do have um, banks uh, here in the state and across the country now uh, that will do deposits in banking and allow for um, deposits and debit cards to pay bills and stuff like that. But it's still federally illegal. So you see a lot of the uh, credit unions kind of take that on themselves and they, uh, there's a big reporting structure. I mean, we still have to pay taxes to the IRS. Right. Um, and if you don't, they're still there knocking on your door, asking for it. The state of Maine is getting their excise tax and their income tax off it. So everybody's getting all the benefits from a government level of cannabis. Um, you just have to find kind of these workarounds with private lending and smaller credit unions that are willing to kind of pick up the pieces. You've Inadvertently, we've almost created this own little microcosm of lending and banking so the banks, I'm assuming, uh, are concerned about or don't want to lend uh, in the traditional manner to marijuana growers because it would run afoul of federal law. Correct. I, and most of the FDIC thing is the big, as soon as it goes to a federal level then. And, and again, some of, we were just talking about consolidation. I mean, some people will just walk away from a project. And I don't think banks have seen the, the history or the tenure of cannabis to be strong enough to really start putting out um, Big loans. I have seen some local banks that are doing lending on cannabis properties. Um, can, you, can you name some? Uh, Scout Hegan, Scout Hegan, um, Scout Hegan uh, Savings Bank does uh, does it, and uh, I believe um, is I it Seaport yeah, Credit. Seaport is a great bank for kind of deposits. Uh, it's expensive because um, I mean there's a cash fee to everything, and uh, there's monthly fees to it. Um, but they're not lending uh, on cannabis or to cannabis uh, or to cannabis owners. Right. Um, Evergreen, a new credit union in yep. town, uh, they, they will lend uh, on certain projects uh, and they'll actually lend, I believe, to uh, owners or employees. We, we don't work with them as of yet. Uh, we're strictly at Seaport. But there are some, there are some banks that are kind of catching on and, and, and making some money on this market while they can. You know, one of the articles I read about you, um, I, I, it said that one of your stated goals is to become the largest cannabis company in the state of Maine. That's happened. Is it true? I would say from the cultivation standpoint, we're one of the biggest. Now, there have been some people that have kind of caught up when you look at, they, they call it vertically integrated. So that would mean you have your cultivation, your extraction, and your retail. So there's a couple of phenomenal guys out there that have surpassed us in terms of a vertically integrated style. But from a cultivation standpoint, we're absolutely one of the biggest. Would it be pre premature to call you Maine's king of cannabis? So that, I got a lot of fact for that. When that came, that came out in an article, one of the first articles I did, and uh, it was more of a joke because I, I had just finished my last project with uh, a private equity project, non-cannabis related, um, with a gentleman named Ron, who you know. Yep. And uh, I was telling him just what we were doing. He said, man, you're going to be Maine's king of cannabis. And I was joking about it with the, inter, with the interviewer. And... Uh, she took it and wrote it in there, and it it, 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 it was, I still hear about it to this day. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a fun thing. I take it very, very lightly. There were all kinds of comments and stuff in the article about who is this guy, and 
Mr. Rock. I, every article I ended up doing, or every newspaper or photo or something, I had a sweater on. So people call, started calling me like the Mr. Rogers of cannabis because I always had a sweater <laughs> or something on. Uh, but it was it, again, a lot of these guys are, are good friends, and we know each other in the community. So. I mean, you know, to take a dig from somebody that's just doing it playfully is, is fun. And then all the other haters, I really just didn't pay attention to. But Well, actually, it might be true. I'm king of <laughs> cannabis. I mean, I would, I would you're, like, you're, well, you're well on your way. I would like to be. That, if I could own that title, that would be a great title. But there are some great guys in the state that are, are, are competing for that crown as well. <laughs> <laughs> so you're 38 years old. Mm -hmm. um, you've been through a lot in your life. You really have. Mm -hmm. Do you have a long-term plan or do you kind of make it up as you go? Um, I typically like to do things on a, on a three to five year view. Um, I ha th th there's a, we all have these kind of groups or people, um, that we watch and we grow up watching, um, and admiring, uh, Blackstone as a company, um, they, they bought the la they bought the company I was at prior to cannabis and I just loved their model. I, I liked their, their, again, just a big hedge fund. I like the three, five, seven year view on things. So I like to have kind of a short term goal and view uh three six nine months and then i have kind of these bigger goals for three to five years and uh in cannabis right now um i've got some fun stuff in the works right now that would take it to probably a five to seven year view um not just here in the states but globally and can you share what that is or would that be giving away <clears throat> um i could uh there's just uh Again, you spend so many years in a certain industry, and then you kind of uh, culminate everything you've done as, as an adult and as a professional, and you start to see where your strengths lie and where you want to be. As you get older, you can kind of pick and choose where you would like to be. Um, and one thing that we're seeing a lot of, it, we're seeing some international uh, growth in Germany, Costa Rica, uh, and some of the other South American, um, South American um, countries. And where they're at such a, a, a young and kind of the genesis of their cannabis industry, it would be fun to go in there and help develop um, some of these, some of the infrastructure, some of this campus style model, um, more as a um, more as a consultant and kind of right. kind of helper of all things than just here's your job for the next three years, put your nose to the grinding stone and go. I've done that for twenty plus years now and. Um, I like the idea of new projects and working with new people and anything outside of negative 20 for six months out of the year would be a lot of fun. Uh, so anything warmer, the southern part of the country, um, Georgia, the Carolinas, Texas will be last, Mississippi. A lot of those groups are, or states are starting to come online. Uh, and I think one of the best things a state can do is look at the states that had great success yeah. um, and try to model their up and coming launch of cannabis. So even if I could help steer uh, regulatory and kind of governmental cannabis uh, to start off correctly would be a really nice way to just kind of level set so there's no up and down and confusion with a, from a state level when they kind of go. You, you don't live in Maine anymore at this point. You I live don't. in Florida. I live in Florida now. Um, we still have a, a home here that we, we like to come back to. Uh, but as of uh, October, uh, we, we went and started the, the snowbird thing. Yeah. Yeah. And you're liking it? I do. Yeah. It's, uh, but what's not to like? Yeah. It was 85 and sunny when I left. And I, I will admit it to come up for a couple snowstorms is, is always nice and it makes you feel at home. Yeah. You got, well, you got one today. Yeah. We got one Saturday coming. <laughs> um, well, cannabis is legal in the state of Maine and, uh, you can easily buy it. That doesn't necessarily mean cannabis is good for you. There are those that point to studies that say long-term use of marijuana, and some people can lead to uh, mental illnesses like psychosis. What are your thoughts on all that? Uh, so a lot of those studies, again, you go back to the federal, um, that it's federally illegal. And to do an appropriate study, you need funding to do these kind of studies. And there hasn't been any real United States of America funding uh, to study this. Uh, Israel has been doing medical cannabis uh, studies for 30, 40 years, and their studies would contradict almost anything that a private group would put out put out here in America. Um, I think uh, I think a, car a smoke smoke is a carcinogen, which is probably not the healthiest for you. Is it as bad as a cigarette? No, uh, but still, smoke of any kind is kind of a a, a negative to your lungs, uh, and that's one of the the beauties of kind of 
the the growth in this this space is that we have an extraction facility that can take the cannabis, take the cannabinoids, the terpenes, the THC, and put it into a gummy or put it into a, a edibles. A, yeah, something like that, where it's it's an ingestible and a consumable, and you're still getting kind of that that uh, that medical effect or even just the calming effect. I know a lot of people that don't need it for a medical issue, but they'll take it at night instead of a uh, like a Z-Quil or an Ambien or whatever a sleep aid would be. Yeah, or even a melatonin. I've seen people do a, a melatonin CBD small THC, which is all great natural stuff for you, and they sleep better than any type of prescription. So Probably no, they don't wake up. Yeah, no, exactly. And, it, and it's health. They feel rested without that kind of prescription hangover lag. Yeah, so I, again, contradictory until we see real funding to, to do a study. But I, I've, I've seen it work in my own family. My grandmother was avid against anything cannabis and towards the later part of her life uh she had a tincture that she took she was uh she was a six to eight um bayer um pain pill a day for her arthritis mm -hmm. and before the last year of her life before she passed she wasn't using any medication for her arthritis she was sleeping better her restless leg syndrome went away and 25 years of arthritis and restless leg gone within a couple of days of starting a, a good quality cannabis treatment she was probably wondering why she hadn't started it 25 years earlier. Correct. Right? <laughs> and she's the woman that probably would have. <laughs> she should have. Um, can you explain how your business is taxed by the state of Maine? And how does that compare with other states, perhaps Michigan, which you also have? Uh, yeah, especially at our level on the cultivation side. Maine is probably the worst tax state for cultivation in the entire country. Uh, Maine charges $335 per pound of cannabis sold. Um, so if it costs you... Five hundred to a thousand dollars to create a pound of cannabis, you can tack on three hundred and thirty-five dollars for every single pound of cannabis you sell. So, um, where the pricing is where it is now, it's probably one of the worst, if not the worst, in the entire country. And how would that compare with, say, Michigan? There is no tax on sale of wholesale cannabis. There will be a a state tax um, at the at the point of sale at like a retail right. facility, but from Extra extraction or cultivation to that, there there isn't one. So it, it it quite literally could be the worst in the country. Is there any restriction from, <clears throat> say, a retailer buying product from Massachusetts and shipping it in? Yes. So no interstate uh, commerce of cannabis in any state. That that's a big no no, uh, and it goes back to uh, the testing requirements for Maine might be different than Mass and vice versa. Um, New Hampshire is. They might have just gone medical, but you couldn't take Massachusetts cannabis, go to New Hampshire, and then go into Maine. That that wouldn't be allowed either. So you're, you're forced to, they call it a multi-state operator, to set up your kind of business in each individual state. Uh, and that's where kind of the branding comes in. So if you've got a strong brand in Maine, Michigan, Florida, then you have a better chance at jumping into a new state because you've got some brand recognition and kind of that historical tenured product. And I don't know if you know the answer to this, but if I'm driving down the road and I've got a bale of marijuana in my back seat, is that legal? In Maine? In Maine. Um, depending on the size and weight of that bale. Um, if you were a, a, a caregiver uh, and you had a ticket, a, a travel ticket that said, I'm Greg Bolas, I just produced this bale of 100 pounds of cannabis at my facility, you could drive all over the state with it. But if you, if you bought it? No, you would have, I mean, there are, even in the, the medical world, as well as adult use, there, there are tracking pieces in place where if you're medical or adult use, you would have to, they call it a trip ticket or a, a metric manifest where you would have to have kind of your, your, your paperwork to drive around with that. Um, as just a state um, resident, uh, I don't think you could drive, <clears throat> excuse me, around with a bail, um, <laughs> but you could definitely drive around with a fair amount now because it is legal to... Have it, I mean, keep it right in your glove box. And again, if you have a fair amount on you, even if it is like the max legal limit, depending on who were to pull you over or check on you, they might want to check your, like, are you high right now driving around with it? So it's still very illegal to drive while under the influence of cannabis. Of um, but to drive around with it, you'd probably be all right, depending on the weight. Can they test for that? <clears throat> I mean, drunken driving, you can test it, right? right? But for marijuana, how do they test? Uh, they're going to go right for your eyes. They're going to look for a smell. But that's one of the most difficult things to test for because, I mean, there is no, I mean, you could smoke two weeks ago and it's still going to be in your bloodstream. It'll still be in your urine. So it's a lot different than alcohol, which will filter through real quickly. Um, or any of the other narcotics that kind of filter through quickly. Cannabis is going to be in there for, for quite some time if you're an avid user. So to test for it, they're really going to look at your eyes. They're going to do kind of the... Um, 
the the cognitive test. Are you like follow my pen? They're gonna look at your eyes, and they'll, they'll do a, they'll they'll do their standard under the or, or what is it DUI or OUI? I can't remember which one it is. Um, kind of check on you, and if they find that you are, it'd probably just be one of the easiest ones to fight because there is no real. I was gonna say in court, I would imagine that would be difficult. To it would be pretty difficult. Yeah, interesting. But they could also go back and say, oh well, he seemed high. He had a joint going in his car. Well, <laughs> that, that might be something. But if you were just driving around and you had red eye, I mean, allergy season here in Maine lasts quite a while. I mean, you would never want to confuse someone who's like not feeling well or has allergies and say, well, I think you're high. You're going, we're going to arrest you for OUI or DUI. <laughs> you really just had an allergy issue and you didn't feel good. Wow, interesting. So it's, it's a little, again, they're working, there, there's groups out there that are trying to create a, a cannabis style um, breathalyzer type test, but to prove that out would be years out. You know, I was talking to a friend of mine who's in the moving and storage business, mm -hmm. and one of the uh, concerns or issues he has is hiring drivers who, sure. because they have to <clears throat> take, be uh, drug tested. Yep. And so if you're a recreational user of marijuana and you smoke Saturday nights, as you said, it stays in your system. I've sure. heard up to a month. Oh yeah, absolutely. And you get tested two weeks down the road, even though you've never smoked during the work work day right. or while you're driving. Yep. Uh, you can lose your license or lose your lose your job. Sure. Yep. And that's still very active. They, the medical side of things. Now that there are like the medical cards and there are medical uh, reasons for it, um, work for maybe a, a privatized company or a smaller company. Um, I know the DoD was trying to allow medical. Um, marijuana use for, for, for their workers. I don't think it made it all the way through. Uh, so you're seeing some reform on the medical side of things. Um, but yeah, I mean, anything that's kind of has that government stamp over it or they're using certain insurances or anything backed with, with the Fed. Sometimes even if you have a contract with a federal uh, group and you're not technically a federal employee, but because you have that contract, you still will be tested per the federal guidelines. Right. So it is, it's, we're in this kind of, weird turning point of this industry where it's okay 90% of the time to sell and to use and to pay your taxes and make money, but there's still that 10% where now we're not 100% okay with it uh, from a government level, federal level. In the state of Maine, I imagine, is making a fair amount of money on the taxes. Oh yeah, absolutely. They're, 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 they're making great money because getting, they're getting taxes from the cultivation, they're getting taxes from the extraction, and they're getting taxes at the retail level. So. They're they're doing they're doing well. So on the extraction as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So they're getting taxed. So if, again, go back to that vertically integrated kind of model where you own your own cultivation, your own extraction, your own retail. You could be getting hit three different times along the way for testing cost as well as taxes costs. So that's why people think, oh, you're in cannabis, you're making all this money. Well. The state of Maine is making a lot of money. The testing labs are making a lot of money. We're just trying to fit all these costs into a certain model. So that's why being a low-cost producer kind of gives you that little bit of wiggle room. In, in terms of testing, how often do you have to test the product? Every single time there's a new, new harvest, anytime there's something new, and they kind of do it in a, a batch form, so up to 22 kilograms per flower batch. So if you have a pretty large harvest, you could end up testing your entire um, your entire harvest with six to ten different tests for just that one harvest, and that's every single time. And does you said it was the CDC? The CDC is the one. Do that, they come into your facility? And no, test? That, that would be um, you. Uh, you kind of have like this. Uh, you would have your your toad or whatever you keep your cannabis in, and then you kind of sample. You have to pick from different sections of the bin. You put it in kind of a testing bag, and then you would bring it to uh, a testing lab, and then they would test it there. And how long does it take for them to turn around results? It can be as quick as four days. I've watched it take 19 business days on one of our last ones because uh, as of January of this year, they added pesticide testing to the adult use market. Um, so now you're testing for all kinds of pesticides, you're testing for microbials, you're testing for yeast and mold. So for, there's and there's only two testing facilities in the state that can do all of that. So you've got everybody in the state going to these two facilities to try to get it done as fast as possible. And there's kind of a little bit of a backlog, but we've seen it as quick as three to four days. And we're seeing those kind of timelines stretch out a little bit longer now that there's more testing to be done. So in the meantime, you're waiting. Yep. What do you do? Just keep 
moving the product through your system yeah, and so, just not finally selling it until... Yeah, so the amount of harvests you do a year kind of dictates on inventory control. So if you have a, a really big month and you're getting low on cannabis, typically you have another harvest getting ready to be tested and come right behind it. So it is there is a lot of inventory management behind it based off the size and scale that you would hyster- historically produce. Pardon me. Um, but sometimes if you are planning on a two-week testing time and it turns out to be 20 days... There could be times where people are just waiting for product. Again, good problem to have when people are waiting for product versus having too much of it just sitting around. Nice. Um, but there is kind of that balance of, do I have too much? Do I have too little? How long will it take to test? And everything in between. So it, it is a very, um, it, it's a logistics battle as well. Do they test for strength? Oh, yeah. Potency? Absolutely. Yep. Um, and do lot- they limit you in terms of how potent it can be? Not not here um, and not yet. There are some states that are looking at uh, proposing, I think Oregon just proposed a 30% THC cap um, on flour and they're looking at a 60% cap on um, the extracted type products, the batter, shatter diamonds, all those things. So, And would that get labeled on the packaging? Yep. So every time uh, any package, any from down to like a single joint to uh, an ounce, uh, which is kind of the largest you would buy in a, a retail f- environment, has a little sticker that says when it was produced or who produced it, when it was harvested, uh, the THC content. Some people even do terpene content, which is kind of the flavors that go along with it instead of just this massive THC hit. A lot of people do like different strains for different reasons. Um, so a lot of that would be right on that package tag. And the bud tenders at the retail level, the guys that are actually working the store, those are some of the best advocates in the entire world because they're the ones that are typically trying it first. You'll drop samples off and then they can tell the, the consumer, hey, if this is what you're looking for, try this. It's got great THC. The terpene profile is really, really on point and they can kind of direct people to a certain product based off their their use. Or if you're an occasional user, you don't want to be taking something that's super strong. Right. Like a lot of, like some people, and, and that's been a big thing in the market over the last couple of years. Um, there's this understanding where you need 25, 28, 30 and above THC to, to really have a great high or to be really high. Um, where a high teens or low twenties with a good terpene profile will almost give you a better high. It's maybe might be a little more giggly than just like sitting in your couch, like just wrecked. So um, as, as kind of, they call them kind of cannabis connoisseurs, as the kind of connoisseur market uh, develops and people are using it here and there and maybe a little bit more, they're like a, like a, like a sommelier with wine. Like, yeah. you, you know, hey, I really like Opus One, which I happen to love Opus One, but at $400 a bottle, it's not your everyday drinker. So you would go to something that's uh, um, maybe more of like a, like a Bordeaux or, or something like that. That's your $20, $25 a night that you pick up at the store for your every night type of drinker. So you will have kind of that one size fits all kind of flower that might be for uh, your everyday use. And then you have some guys that produce just really great, high quality cannabis, more in the boutique fashion that you say, all right, I'll go spend a little bit of extra money because I like the strain. I like the terpene profile. I like the way this makes me feel I just can't do it every type of day type of thing. So different uh, cannabis for different occasions. Absolutely. Yeah, and different people. Some people can't can't or don't want to be that high. They might like to just take a couple hits off a low, uh, low THC uh, joint or pen and just to be a little bit level or something like that versus that, hey, it's the weekend. We're going to do this at a beach party or something. We're going to smoke the... 32% THC joint and just get wrecked. And hopefully Uber there. Yes, and that, again, <laughs> that's one of the best things. Or have it brought to you. A lot of delivery services in the medical world will bring it to you um, so you're not driving around getting it or anything like that. And you can always have a designated driver yeah. to get you home. It's amazing how things have changed over the years. I know. That's, I'm, I'm waiting for uh, Uber to jump into the cannabis delivery business. <laughs> Drop it off. and If there's money there, up, they'll, I'm sure they'll be They'll doing jump it. into it, that's for sure. Hey, Cliff, thank you so much for joining me on the Bolus Beat and giving us your time and perspective and information. It's great. Thank you. Very interesting. Appreciate it. Cliff, thank you for being our guest today on the Bolus Beat, the Bolus Company podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. You can learn more about Kanapa Valley Farms at the company's website, which is kanapavalleyfarms.com and on Instagram at kanapavalleyfarms.com. And if you'd like to learn more about the Bolus Company, please be sure to visit us at www.bolus.com. 
You can also find us at The Bolus Company on Facebook and LinkedIn and at The Bolus Co. on Instagram and Twitter. And lastly, if you want to know the secret to owning real estate, it's pretty simple. Just be sure to outlive your debt. <laughs>